Good afternoon and welcome to the American University of Armenia. We are very pleased to be hosting this event in collaboration with the Aurora Humanitarian Initiative. Founded on behalf of the survivors of the Armenian Genocide and in gratitude to their saviors, the Aurora Humanitarian Initiative seeks to empower modern-day saviors to offer the life and hope to those in urgent need of basic humanitarian aid and thus continue the cycle of giving internationally. Today, we have the pleasure and honor of listening to conversations with the five finalists of the 2017 Aurora Prize for Awakening Humanity. A university is a perfect setting for this purpose. As discussed at the presentation of the Aurora Humanitarian Index yesterday, there is a positive correlation between the level of education and a person's inclination towards humanitarian acts. So in a sense, the audience here, which includes hundreds of students from AUA and other universities in Yerevan, represents a good number of future humanitarian activists. Surely, they will benefit from hearing this group of role models. I have the pleasure of once again announcing the availability of Aurora Graduate Scholarships. As a part of the Aurora Graduate Projects, uh, Gratitude Projects, and in cooperation with Skola Mandi Armenia, Ruben Bartanian and Veronica Zonabend have granted the American University of Armenia a $1 million fund to be used towards scholarships for citizens of Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria, regardless of their ethnic backgrounds. These scholarships are meant as an expression of gratitude to the peoples of these countries who sheltered many Armenian refugees and saved them from extermination during the genocidal acts of Ottoman Turkey from 1915 to 1923. <laughs> AUA is proud to be part of this initiative. On behalf of the university and the many students who will benefit from these scholarships, I express sincere thanks to Rupen and Veronica for their generosity. Now I would like to invite uh, Ruben Bartanian, the co-founder of Aurora Humanitarian Initiative, to the stage. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. I'm really happy to be here with all of you, with uh, my mentor and senior partner, co-founder, together with me, Aurora Humanitarian Initiative, Vartan Grigayan. And unfortunately, Nubar not with us today. He's coming late night because uh, his daughter just graduated Harvard. And this is, for him, a big event, but they're coming with the full family. And we're all three founders. We are delighted to be today in university, which is alma mater for the young, talented people going and life and doing something good for the world. I'm also very happy to open official part of the, our uh, award uh, days in Armenia because we launch our uh, 2017 ceremony from April 24 when we make announcement about finalists, but today is the first day where we can meet all the finalists, we're all in Armenia and I'm very, um, thankful for all of them, but despite very hard work what they're doing in their own countries, they came, they were with us, and they accept our invitation. Thank you for coming. And what you're doing is really admirable. <laughs> we're doing a second year, and we're learning lessons, we're doing improvements, we're trying to be clear with the messages that we're trying to deliver to the world. And one thing I want to again say is uh, very important element of this, all what we're doing is uh, the stories that we got is 254 stories of the people unique who make 
in different parts of the world, in 66 countries, brave steps saving lives of other people despite all the problems or the, putting their lives under risk. And it is an amazing collection of stories of the people who are doing something which you don't expect usual people would do. And I think it's very important what we are today presenting is only five stories, but believe me, it's all about this is happening every day, every in different countries, and it's uh, in reality. It's not the storytelling. It's the people who every day putting their lives under risk. And when we did our first ceremony, we've been very nervous about how many new stories we'll get. And I want to remind you, the last year we got only 115 stories, only 115 stories we got from 18 countries. And it's showing, and only this year we got replications of the nominants only 20%, which means every year we're getting more and more real stories showing that the people, despite all the bad things going around us, trying to do the best to save the world. And today we have an opportunity to talk about this all. And before we're opening the discussion with the finalists, of course, it's my big pleasure to in invite to this stage our first laureate of the Aurora Humanitarian Prize 2016, Margaret Barankitz. stupid question. They ask me to tell you about the impact, impact of Aurora Prize. But when I look to you, the impact is there. I look how you are shining. Look to your neighbors. Here is a paradise. Please, I want to tell you that you, Ruben, and you, our father, you create a paradise. You give us, when you create Aurora Prize, you create with love, compassion, gratitude, dignity. How you can ask me to tell you about the impact of love? impact of compassion, you give us dignity. You give us the hope. Because when I ask to the children, you must imagine when they know that you, we get this award in the refugee camp where there are 60,000 people or the night they were dancing, or the night they say, ah, where is Armenia? Why Armenia is sharing our suffering? Please, I want that you can applaud. First, you change completely our lives, the lives of Burundian refugees, because they were thinking nobody is sharing our suffering. For that, I must tell you that all those young people who return in university, all those women who can feed and send their children back to school, they sent me to tell you, thank you. Thank you, Armenian people, because now all the young people, they read about genocide of uh, Armenian people, and then, I must tell you one good example of one tortured young man. They castrated this man, young man. 
He's 25 years old. And I ask him, Ivan, what I can do for you? And he said, don't worry. Since I read the story about Aurora, this young lady who fled the country now, I have a hope. Even I am handicapped. I want to walk, and I will do like Aurora. This is impact. This is, you hear all those young people who lost, who had lost the country, who had lost their lives, but today they can stand up and begin to live. You restore their lives, their lives. Please, when I see what you have done, it's not, you don't create NGO. You only allow us. Now, with the three foundation, I can say, yes, I had helped them. Now they are there. Not like the foundation to help us. You create another vision for humanity. You give us dignity. All those people who were thinking only for their suffering, you show that even you had suffered. In Armenia, you said, why to, to think about uh, Armenian people only? You think to the children of Brasilia, the children of Ethiopia, the children of Congo. Thank you very much. Today, we can celebrate humanity. We are full of gratitude and we can change the world. Thank you. Now we are shining and we turn the page. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you really had a chance to watch the movie, how Margaret invests the money in uh, different institutions which help kids in Brazil, Congo, and Burundi, and how its effect already started to work. We believe the snowing ball effect is already going around the world, and we no, we're not getting only awards for the past, but we're creating continuity of this type of the activity from the people who already made absolutely sacrificing their lives in many, many de decades. But we can see today how this all is continuing. And we can see by also, we're very happy with my wife doing scholarship for kids from Middle East coming and studying in Armenia, which is uh, kids who are studying now in United World College, Dilijan. It's all about one thing. We believe about our future. And I want to say thank you before giving a chance to continue this conversation to our finalists and our moderator to people who join us. We started with Vartan and Nobar, which was three of us. Last year was 70 people. This year, 200 people join us, and many of them non-Armenian. And I want to say really thank you for becoming part of this whole process, because only together we change the world. And gratitude in action is a slogan which we believe is the best way describing what we believe we can do. We can do maybe sometimes very small steps, but we going together to change the world for better. And for this, I want to invite to discussion about this all um, our moderator, which I'm very welcome, please welcome to moderator of today's conversation, is a professor of religion at the University of South California, Donald Miller. And I want to give the floor more to a professional academic. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you Donald. Thank you, Rupan. One thing that last year's Aurora Prize winner did not mention is not only is she from Rwanda, a small country in Central Africa, but in the capital, Kigali, of Rwanda, there is a genocide museum, memorial museum, and one of the walls is on the Armenian genocide. So on April 24th, in this small country in Central Africa, 
the Armenians and the sufferings of 1915 are well known. Now, it is a real honor for me to be able to moderate this panel. And it's an honor for the following reason. My own father-in-law was a survivor of the genocide of 1915. And the reason that he survived and the reason that I've now been married to an Armenian for 48 years <laughs> is because an American missionary, Henry Riggs, came to Armenia and he, with many people who intervened on behalf of Armenians, created an orphanage in the area of Harpert, which was where my father-in-law and his family were from. And after my father-in-law and his sister, both of whom were taken from the deportation marches and lived for two years in a Turkish home, she was, the sister was abducted, then they ran away to this orphanage. So I am very, very grateful to be able to moderate this particular panel. Now, what is the purpose of the Aurora Prize? As I see it, it is to hold up examples from around the world of people who know what it is to live fully, to live purposeful lives, to live meaningfully. These five finalists are all individuals with a deep moral center. They are people of courage, of tenacity, of vision, and of commitment. They express the possibility of hope in a world that sometimes is very dark, filled with violence and exploitation. In some ways, they might be viewed as moral entrepreneurs. And the reason I use that term is because each of them has started or works within an organization that is intervening on behalf of those who are vulnerable, individuals who are poor, and individuals who are at risk. So a screen is going to drop here in just a moment, and I invite you to watch five short videos. Each one is just a minute long on the work of the finalist of the Aurora Prize, which you will meet in just a moment.
I want to now invite our finalists to come and take a place, and I'll explain in just a moment um, why we have four seats and why, for a moment, the fourth seat will actually be empty. But as they're coming forward, I have just several logistical announcements. One is, please log in, if you have a phone with you, to the free AUA guest Wi-Fi. And it should be open without a password. We're welcoming you to submit questions via two different means. One is through Twitter and the hashtag Aurora Prize, and the other is through Facebook to go to the Aurora Prize Facebook page. And on that page, you'll see an area that says Ask Finalist. And you can pose your questions in Armenian, in English, and there's some people who are magically going to feed me your questions onto my iPad. And so uh, I will be interacting with all of you via technology and addressing questions to our panelists. Now, to my immediate right is Tom Katina. <laughs> He is a Catholic missionary. You're going to hear more about what it is that inspires him in our question and answer period. He's working in the Nuba Mountains, as you saw, in South Sudan, um, a very dangerous place, um, and uh, we'll hear more about his experience. Then immediately to his right, is Fartoon Adan. She is the executive director of the Elman Peace and Human Rights Center in Somalia, 
and um, in your program you'll see that she is also pictured with her daughter and she will explain why her daughter chose to actually stay behind in Somalia in order to negotiate a child hostage release. Uh, otherwise, she would be here joining her mother. And then uh, to her right is someone who just literally arrived at the airport moments ago. Um, and that is uh, Jamilia Afghani. She is focused on educational, economic, social empowerment of women in 18 different provinces in Afghanistan. We're looking forward to hearing more from you. And to my actual great surprise, because I think he just landed 30 minutes ago, <laughs> I'm just absolutely delighted that uh, Dr. Dennis um, Mukegwa uh, is here. Thank you. <laughs> Since 1999, he and his staff have cared for more than 50,000 survivors of sexual violence, treated people with wounds, addressed their legal challenges, um, and also in many ways helped them with a number of psychosocial issues that they face. Now, the one person who unfortunately is not able to be with us is Muhammad Darwish. The reason for that is that he recently had to be evacuated from Syria. He went to Turkey. He applied for travel documents so he could be here with us, but unfortunately they have not arrived in time. And um, so you were able to see his video and um, in the program, there's a further description, um, and I'm so sorry that he was not able to join us for those reasons. Now, while you've seen a one-minute video <laughs> just profiling each of our five finalists, I actually want them to uh, say a little bit more in their own words about um, what it is they do and a theme that I think crosses all five of our finalists is the following. I think in your own unique ways, each of you is addressing the issue of the rights of women. You're doing that in terms of sexual violence against women, gender equality, access to health care, and also education. So what I'd like you to do is take maybe about four minutes each. We can start with Tom, and I'll just remind you, you need to push the little red button when you speak, and then when you finish speaking, uh, turn it off so we don't get feedback uh, from our microphones. But I'd like you to explain very briefly, and maybe with an example, of how your organization addresses the issues of the rights of women. Tom. Can you hear me? Is it on? Is it working? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I speak very fast, so if you can't understand me or I speak too fast, just wave your hand. Tell me to slow down, please. Uh, my name is Tom Katina. I'm a, a medical doctor and a surgeon. I'm originally from the United States. Um, if you know where that is, uh, it's that way. And uh, I've been working in Africa for 17 years now. The last nine years I've been in Sudan. That's where I live. We're actually in the Republic of Sudan, in the southern portion, in an area called the Nuba Mountains. And uh, this is a people that uh, have been at war for really the past 30 years. The most recent war started in uh, June 2011. And as we speak, we're still in a, a state of civil war. We. Uh, uh, have a hospital there and six outreach clinics. We are run by the Diocese of El Obeid under the uh, uh, rubric of the Catholic Church. I'm a Catholic lay missionary with the Catholic Medical Mission Board. 
which I've been doing that work for the past 17 years. We, we run a 435-bed referral hospital. We, we are the referral hospital for the entire uh, Nuba Mountains region, an area the size of Austria, uh, or those that are familiar with the U.S. are about the size of Georgia, the state, not the country of Georgia. Um, we treat all uh, the comers. Uh, anybody who comes to our hospital is treated. That's from uh, elderly people to premature babies. We do all manner of surgery from the head to the chest to the abdomen to the extremities. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of rights of women, uh, we're not specifically a women's hospital. Uh, probably our, our, our biggest contribution in that respect would be in our maternal child health clinic and our maternity ward in the hospital. Uh, in the mountains, probably 99.999% of women deliver at home. Very few people have access to, nobody has access to a hospital. If they can, if they can reach us, it's, it's usually a long distance. Most women deliver at home. So our, our uh, maternal mortality rate is quite high. Our neonatal mortality rate is also quite high. We are trying uh, our, our, our level best to improve maternity services throughout Nuba Mountains. Uh, we're about the only hospital offering cesarean sections and a full range of maternity services. We're just trying to uh, improve our maternal child health clinics uh, in our outreach clinics. Um, the other uh, things we do there, we, we uh, of course, in the past six years since the war started, we become a trauma hospital treating all, all manner of war-related injuries. Um, and with, with hopefully with the exposure of this award, uh, we hope to improve uh, the services that we can offer to the Nuba people, uh, especially to women. We hope to expand our services through the clinics or other, other outlets. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> I think I should maybe ask you uh, to hold your applause, unless something really moves your heart. <laughs> um, and it will give us more opportunity for questions and responses. And uh, forgive my informality, but since many of you are students, um, I will be calling our panelists by their first name. And I would ask uh, Fartoon to go next. And maybe also just briefly say something about your daughter and why she cannot be here, as well as give us an example of what it is that you do in Somalia. Oh, I shouldn't touch it. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much for having me here. It's, uh, I'm very excited to be here. And my daughter, she, she wanted to be here. She was excited more than me. But we were negotiating for a long, for a few months for the children who was fighting front line and Somali government um, captured and they were very small children and then it's uh, one of the negotiation was they gonna get killed or we are saying this is the children and then we can rehabilitate or it is a mistake so it's uh, now we get the opportunity to talk to negotiate with it so she stayed behind and she's very sorry she was she missed it but that was important so that's why she's there so I'm talking Elman Elman Beast and Human Rights it's an organization we have been working on women issue and child soldiers and women issue is a uh, we the first organization talk about Somalia as a rape. We have issue of rape. And as a Somali, we always denying the rape and saying we are a Muslim, we don't rape women. And that is the, we are the first organization come up and say, this is the problem we have. Because in that time we are working as a human rights. So we're going different places and we saw how many women are getting raped and no one was talking about it. So we, the first organization who did the crisis center in Mogadishu, and then everyone was coming, and we see the huge need was there. And we, the advocacy, we start that. Now we are, everyone is talking about it, and we are admitting it, saying, this is the problem we have, how can we fix it? So that is the stage we are now in, when it comes to rape. Thank you, Jamila. 
And now um, we would like to hear from Afghanistan. <laughs> First of all, I, I want to say uh, um, thank you to Harora for providing us the opportunity to be with you all today and share some uh, points from Afghanistan with you. Uh, well, uh, uh, when I started working for women's rights in Afghanistan, uh, it was very relevant to my personal life because I'm a woman and having a disability. And my disability was the only reason for my, for my parents to allow me to attend school. And I am the only educated child of my family. And I found that education is very important for the life of women who can change their life and can change the life of others. It's just like a candle. If you light a candle, that candle will be in position to light many other candles to bring brightness and happiness in the society. Uh, when I start my work, uh, uh, from the beginning, I had opposition from my family, my father, my brothers, my cousins, and society overall, and mostly religious leaders, imams, were opposing my work and my activity. And it was... Uh, uh, not fit in my logic that how a religion can sustain a part of um, his follower or its follower from getting education. I start uh, working with imams, educating imams uh, about the women's rights uh, from Islamic perspective with different vision, with different uh, uh, understanding that I had from the Islamic uh, scripts verses of Quran and Hadith. Uh, I start my work uh, with 25 Imam from Kabul, and today we are working with 6,000 Imams in 22 provinces of Afghanistan. And these Imams has, uh, have become agents of um, uh, peace, and they are working for uh, women's education, girls' education, and also uh, they are opposing on many other issues related to women, such as child marriage, forced marriages, and also we have some other customary laws, like exchange of daughters with animal and some other things and money. So uh, they are working. So uh, that's why uh, 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 I found that education is very important uh, uh, for all of us, for all of us in the world, and especially in the country, Afghanistan, where women are always under the, 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 uh, the, the shadow of darkness and the shadow of the uh, man domination. I want to compliment our last two speakers on, our, on their English. And we've asked Dr. Dennis to also speak in English, but he has a backup, uh, his friend Tony. And um, so please tell us about your experience, and uh, particularly as it relates to women's rights. Je tiens d'abord à vous remercier I'd like to thank you first for inviting me, giving me this opportunity to be here. Je crois que cet événement est très, très important. This is a very important event. Que nous avons la responsabilité de reconnaître et de pouvoir plutôt corriger. Unfortunately, humanity today forgets to look at these things and to focus on the specifics that we are all talking about now. Euh, 
moi, mon, mon trajet, je, je suis un fils d'un pasteur et je suivais mon père dans euh, ce qu'il faisait comme, comme pasteur. Uh, I'm the son of a pastor and I saw what my father did in his work as a pastor. Et mon départ, je voulais devenir pédiatre par and rapport à ce que je voyais. That I would like to be a, a pediatric doctor. Mais quand je commençais à travailler dans l'hôpital comme pédiatre, je m'étais rendu compte qu'on ne peut pas soigner les enfants si les mères sont en train de mourir en donnant naissance. But I realized right away when I started working as a pediatric doctor that I couldn't only work with children when mothers were sick and were dying. Et donc à ce moment-là, je prends la décision de faire la gynécologie obstétrique dans l'objectif de lutter contre la mortalité maternelle. And so I decided to study gynecology so I could work against maternal mortality. J'ai ouvert, j'ai commencé à travailler dans un hôpital Malheureusement, en 1996, euh, tous mes, mes patients qui n'ont pas pu fuir et les staffs ont été assassinés à l'Emera. I started working in a hospital in 1996, uh, but I have to tell you with great sadness that one day, all the patients and staff at this hospital in Lemera in Eastern Congo were assassinated. Et ça, ça m'a obligé d'aller m'installer à Panzi où j'ai commencé une clinique pour le même objectif lutter contre la mortalité maternelle. And that moved me then to a new hospital Panzi where I continued my work against maternal mortality. Mais ma grande surprise en 1999 la première patiente que j'avais soignée c'est une femme qui a été violée mais après avoir violé Uh, ceux qui ont commis cet acte ignoble ont également tiré à bout portant au niveau de son appareil génital. I started this hospital in 1999. My very first patient was a woman who had been raped. But beyond being raped, she had suffered the most barbarous acts and in particular, armed men had fired into her genitalia. Et à ce moment-là, je pensais que c'était un acte isolé d'un fou qui a perdu la tête. And I thought, this is an isolated act done by a crazy man. Je ne pouvais pas imaginer qu'aujourd'hui, je puisse soigner plus de 50 000 femmes avec des histoires similaires, viol avec torture, viol avec extrême violence. I, I never could have imagined then that now... I can tell you that I've treated over 50,000 of these girls and women who've been raped and abused in this manner. Parti du traitement médical, nous avons développé progressivement le quatre piliers, la prise en charge médico-chirurgicale, la prise en charge psychologique, la prise en charge socio-économique et le dernier pilier, c'est le pilier qui me tient beaucoup à cœur. Parce que j'ai constaté que lorsque les femmes ont eu les, quatre soins, les trois soins, le dernier soin, c'est demander leur droit, demander que justice soit faite, que réparation soit faite, et nous les accompagnons devant le juge, euh, le cours et le tribunal. Et pendant cette période, nous avons développé ce que nous appelons notre pilier de l'approche. Donc, les quatre piliers passent de la healing par la chirurgie à psychosocial interventions for mental healing to socio-economic development so a woman can make her way in the world. And finally, a very important one that I realized had to occur in this circumstance was to work for women so that they have their rights, so that they can go for justice in front of the courts and tribunals of the area. Merci. Thank you very much. I'm starting to get your questions on my iPad, so I would invite you to continue to send them in. Um, this is a question that is addressed to Tom, but I would like to 
invite the other panelists to also respond to it. And the question is, how do you find the strength to do what you do? And I think to generalize that question, what is it that uh, inspires you? What is it that motivates you? Is it religion? Is it spirituality? Is it humanitarian values? And uh, so I'd like all of the panelists to briefly respond to that question. But Tom, please go first. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think primarily my, my motivation uh, for what I do is a religious motivation. As I said before, I'm a Catholic lay missionary uh, in the Catholic Church. And I think our directives come straight from the Bible, straight from the teachings of Jesus. Uh, Christ said in the Bible, whatever you do to the least of my brothers and sisters, you do for me. And I think he meant that in a very literal sense. The least of my brothers and sisters are the poor, they're the oppressed, they're the traumatized. People that have no one else to look after them. People that are neglected, ignored. So if we take care of them, we are taking care of Jesus. We are serving Jesus. The other uh, quote that I, I love from the Bible, uh, and I said this many times before, when uh, Jesus had an encounter with a, a rich young man, and the man approached Jesus and said, hey, what do I need to do to attain eternal life? And Jesus said, we well, have the Ten Commandments. Follow the Ten Commandments and be good. And the guy said, well, I follow the Ten Commandments. I'm already doing that. And Jesus said, fine, if you want to be perfect, you sell everything you have, you give the money to the poor, you pick up your cross, and you follow me. And the Bible says the man went away very sad because he was very rich. He couldn't do it. And uh, I think when Jesus said that, he meant it. He meant it in a very literal sense. Get rid of your, your, your garbage, get rid of your money, get rid of things, all the baggage in your life. Pick up your cross, be courageous, come and follow me, be strong. Follow me means accept hardship. The road is never going to be easy, okay? The road is never going to be easy. If you accept this, be ready. You're going to suffer. You will suffer incredible sorrow. You will suffer physical pain, emotional distress. But the rewards are out of this world. The rewards are eternal. This life is temporary. In case you don't know it, we're all going to die, believe me. <laughs> In a hundred years, not one of us will be here. After that, we have eternity to go. So let's put up with a little bit of, of suffering in this life, a bit of trauma, to attain eternal life. Let's aim for perfection. Jesus gave us the formula. Sell what you have, pick up your heavy cross, and follow me. Get ready to suffer, but the rewards are great. You can live with my Father in heaven. So I take all my inspiration from that. I think there is a certain amount, certainly the, the work that we do is extremely interesting. There's never a boring day. We treat all types of problems, from neonates that are two kilograms with, with congenital birth defects, to elderly people, to cancers, you name it. But eventually that, that work uh, can become tiresome. It's exhausting work. You wake up in the morning and you know you've got to see 500 patients that day. So the strength comes from God, okay? Simply said, I only continue through the grace of God, and I know that. As I'm st sitting here today, only through the grace of God have I survived. Only through the grace of God can I get up every day and do this job. Otherwise, I would have collapsed a long time ago. So I think that's about as honest as I can be with you. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for the wonderful question. What Tom did not tell you is within the year, he got married to a local woman from the Nuba Mountains. So he does have some inspiration also. <laughs> yes, uh, Fartoon. Yes. Um, my motivation is, first, I'm a mom, and I have a daughter. So every time I see a girl who got raped, 
I put that shoes. See, like, this is mine. And the one of the thing is, it's no justice. It's no place to go. And on, the, on top of that, is the stigma involved. So what are you going to do if even your family shame of you? Your family, your village, everyone shame of you, and you didn't do this to yourself. This has happened to you. So when you see this kind of person, that happened, it motivates me. And I feel if I can help someone, I did my job. And that's why when we working with young girls, feeling like I, I got raped, I don't have a future. Telling them you have a future, this is not your fault. And providing education, providing a place to stay, some of the girls, they get raped and they become a pregnant and they don't know where to go. You're not allowed, you don't have any options. You have to have that baby. So what are they gonna do? It's, you don't have a support, your family, you have a stigmatized and nowhere to go. That's why different regions, we have a safe houses and the people, those girls come in and stay there as long as they want to. We negotiate the, with the family and tell them this is your child and that happened. So you have to take it back. The one of the things it always frustrates me is it's, it's no consequences, the people who's doing this. It's no justice. And the other thing is, when we're talking about the women in IDB camps, it's the vulnerability. It's the women are coming with children. It's no man, it's no protection for man. It's no protection for justice. It's no protection even house. They don't even have a house. So it's easy to trade them and they leave. And they don't say anything because they shame of it and they don't know where to go and who to talk to. So when we go into the places and we saw women like that, it's a one of the example was a woman and her mom, mother and daughter were sleeping together and the man came and raped them and they fight back. And what happened was he shoot them and the girl was dead. The mother was there. She was sitting home thinking, not knowing what to do. She kind of lost her mind, but it was no help. So she's one of the people who's working with us now. And when she's telling the story, what happened to the other, this story happened to her, people will open it up. Because it's very sensitive, and people, they have to trust you to, do, to tell you. Otherwise, they will say, I'll tell you, what are you going to do for me? I'm done with it. So I rather hide it and stay home. So this is motivate me when I see those girls are playing basketball, running around, having tea together. That motivates me and it makes me happy I'm doing something. Thank you. Jamelia, I'm going to ask you to push your mic down just a little bit. Perfect. And um, I have to say, I'm so impressed that as a woman, you are educating imams. <laughs> and so I would just like you to talk a little bit how your own faith uh, and your own interpretation of scripture um, and of the Quran um, leads you to the teaching that you do. Thank you. Well, um, it was really challenging and diff difficult job to, to, to be engaged with imams, with religious leaders. Uh, I'm sure that you know Afghanistan and you, many, um, many of you may read about Afghanistan that on daily basis, women noses are cut off, they're slaughtered just like um, sheep and goat. Uh, they are in prison inside their houses. And usually uh, these activities which hackers all around our family and in my society overall. And personally when I was a child I was watching my mother how she was su suffering with domestic violence and other things. 
Uh, and usually the reason was giving that it is Islam. Islam says that women should be obedient, they should be silent, they should obey what man says. As a human being, I think uh, that is why we are different from the other creatures of God. We are human being, we are having the consciousness. And my consciousness was saying that what type of religion is this that for men has such a good benefits and for women has such a <laughs> discredit, uh, why it happens? Like even sometime uh, laughing loudly was shame in our family. Uh, I start reading Quran by myself to see what Quran says. When I studied different interpretation, usually Quran is interpreted by many men scholars. You cannot see women scholars. And everybody had different mentalities. Then I start learning Arabic language by myself. And I start reading Quran to see uh, what Quran tells me. Uh, when I start reading Quran, I found that the, the world is totally changed. Uh, God says, uh, the very basic uh, verses of uh, Quran is about importance of pen, importance of education, and God's aware upon pen. And from the other side, Holy Prophet says that if you want to seek knowledge, you can go to China. And that is obligatory on you. It does not discriminate between men and women. And uh, when I start uh, working with imams, uh, uh, after a session of training that we were talking, I'm trying to be very humble, very polite, and keep their prestige high because I don't want to create more irritation. Uh, so in one of the sessions, when we were talking about importance of education, uh, then I asked imams, uh, okay, how many of you are sending your daughters to school? And the imam said, we? We should send our daughter to school? We? Is it such a shame? I said, when you are talking about religion, and you are talking about importance of education, and now you as a representative of religion, you say it's shame for you? So finally they said, because it's our tradition, that's why. Even we keep down our religious uh, lessons for the sake of our society, for the sake of our tradition. So there was that I understand the gravity of the problem that we had. And I thought it's really important that we should more, more uh, be strategic working with imams about uh, polishing the knowledge they have in order to put it in the right direction. So uh, what made me successful in this work as a woman, uh, it was really difficult for imams to accept as a woman standing in front of them or teaching them because they do not believe in leadership of women. And it's something like against the status quo. Uh, uh, but what empowered me, that was the understanding of my religion and my uh, uh, Quran. The verses like I was putting uh, in front of some of the imams and some of the debates and conversation. And I was challenging them. If you bring a verse from Quran or a quotation from Hadith, uh, for this reason, I will leave my job. I will leave my responsibility. But of course, they hadn't. And even in some of the interpretation of the verses, their viewpoint was different from my viewpoint. After the sum of the discussion, they were agreeing on my understanding. Uh, for example, uh, we have a verse uh, in Quran, which is also in Bible and also uh, uh, in, uh, the, 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 the divine religion we have. It is written in, in similar ways with different word, words. Uh, 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 but that verse in our context, in our society, is uh, uh, translated in different ways. 
Uh, it is about the birth of uh, Mariam, uh, Mari, uh, mother of Jesus. Uh, and when Mari gave birth to Jesus, uh, so some food stuffs are coming from paradise for her and uh, she has uh, given uh, a privilege space uh, to be looked after by Zachariah. Uh, I don't know how we will call it in English, a uh, prophet of that time. And uh, uh, when uh, uh, we know that Mary, mother of Jesus, has such a privilege, uh, Mother of Mary had, had taken oath or maybe um, uh, responsibility that if she gives birth to a child, she will devote that child to the, for the service of the um, uh, um, uh, shrine, the shrine. But when, uh, when she gave the birth, it's Mary, it's girl daughter. She says, oh God, it's girl child. Uh, God says, yes, I know, it's girl child. But with all that, God gives that privilege and that respect to Mary. So the imams in Afghanistan just take that part of the verse. Yes, I know, there is difference between girl, girl child and male child. Not before this story, not after this story. Just they are taking that part and saying, oh, no, God says, there is difference between men and women. Then I justified, okay, just tell me, the privilege Mary had, any other male prophet had, she was receiving ready-made food from paradise for her. Instead, she had parents to look after her. The prophet of that time was responsible to look after her. Any male prophet had that privilege? So, when we are talking about one issue in Quran, we have to look before that, after that, and the background story. So, usually when I define this, the verses in this way, then they say, yes, you are right. <laughs> Thank you. I just got a message that apparently, um, Dr. Dennis, you have an urgent appointment at the embassy. Um, and I don't know the context of this, but I want you to respond very quickly <laughs> to this question, which is one that came from our audience. And uh, the question is this, people in your situation clearly must experience trauma yourself in the type of work that you do. Sometimes clinically it's called vicarious trauma. And so I'm wondering what you personally do in order to care for yourself, that you don't burn out, that you can keep going. So let's hear the answer to that and then it sounds like the embassy is calling. Thank you. Effectivement, le travail que nous faisons est très, très traumatisant. The work that we do absolutely uh, is very traumatic. Uh, je crois que moi-même, à plusieurs reprises, uh, j'étais à un point uh, de pouvoir abandonner. I've already been uh, a number of times feeling that I was at the end of my abilities. Mais je crois que ce qui m'aide à pouvoir continuer, c'est deux choses spécialement. What allows me to continue are, in particular, two things. La première chose, c'est le plus grand commandement que euh, Jésus nous a donné, c'est l'amour. The first is the commandment that we have from Jesus to love. Et je crois que souvent euh, nous répondons à ces commandements euh, d'aimer Dieu, mais l'idéal d'aimer l'autre comme nous-mêmes, 
c'est un idéal que nous repoussons le plus loin possible en essayant d'abord de résoudre nous-mêmes avant de voir l'autre. So we have to look deeply at this commandment to love others as we love ourselves. It's very difficult. And we have to look deeply within ourselves as we think about doing that in the context of our love for God. Et souvent, en fait, on a souvent cette impression que euh, autour de nous, euh, les gens qui sont en face de nous n'ont pas le même besoin, n'ont pas le même sentiment, ne, ne souffrent pas de la même façon, et nous faisons des actes et qui vont faire du mal sans se rendre compte que si c'était nous, qu'est-ce qu'on aimerait bien vouloir que les autres fassent pour nous. And sometimes we look around us and we see these people who are doing these awful things and think that they don't have these needs, they don't suffer the way we do as we look at all these bad things that are occurring all around us. Et donc par rapport à ça, je crois que ça c'est une de de, de grandes forces que moi je trouve dans ces commandements qui m'aident beaucoup à aller de l'avant et à chaque fois pouvoir me poser si c'était moi qu'est-ce que j'aurais bien voulu que l'autre qui est en face de moi fasse pour moi and this is really a source of great strength for me uh, when I look at someone who's in front of me I have to think what do I need to do with this person as I look at her in front of me and think about this commandment and try to be faithful to it. La, la deuxième chose, c'est la force des femmes. The second thing is the strength of women. Quand je reçois les femmes à l'hôpital, elles ont des blessures, elles ont des histoires qui me font pleurer, qui me traumatisent. Et parfois, je me pose la question, est-ce que je vais commencer, comment je vais commencer à aborder le problème que ces femmes me posent. Sometimes women come to my hospital with such serious wounds, so, so much trauma, that I want to cry. And I really ask myself, how am I going to start? How, how am I going to go forward on this? Et surtout, je me demande, est-ce que ces femmes seront capables un jour de se mettre debout, de pouvoir redevenir euh, des femmes euh, normales, puisque lorsque vous avez des femmes qui sont complètement incontinentes, après qu'on ait introduit des bâtons, des baïonnettes tirées dans leur appareil génital, elles perdent les urines, elles perdent les matières fécales, et tout, tout ce qu'elles disent, je ne suis plus une femme, je ne suis plus un humain. And I wonder sometimes, how can this woman reestablish herself in life? She comes to the hospital, and because of her injuries, she's completely incontinent, completely wounded in that part of her body. And wonder, how can she reestablish herself as a woman? How can she reestablish her life? Mais quand je les traite, <coughs> et que je vois la force avec laquelle, en se réveillant de l'anesthésie, c'est rare que ces femmes me posent la question « Quel va être mon avenir ?» Mais toujours la question « Comment va mon enfant ?»« Comment vont mes enfants ?» Même, elles posent des questions sur la sécurité des autres au lieu de penser d'abord à elles-mêmes. Mais then when I operate on these women, even when they are under anesthesia as they come out, instead of asking about themselves, What they ask me is, how is my child? How are my children? And this looking to others instead of looking at oneself uh, is very powerful. Ça, c'est une force que je trouve dans les femmes euh, où je me sens très, très petit. <coughs> And this is a strength that I see in women that gives me strength, that moves me. Je crois que lorsque, à un moment, j'étais au point de tout abandonner et me dire « je ne peux plus continuer », c'est quand on m'a attaqué pour la sixième fois chez moi. On a pris mes filles en otage, on a tué euh, mon ami chez moi. Là, je pensais que 
j'étais arrivé à un niveau où je ne peux plus continuer. Et j'étais vraiment traumatisé de voir mes filles prises comme ça et tuer mon ami dans ma maison. C'était la limite que je ne pouvais plus aller au-delà. And I have felt abandoned when after many attacks, I lived through an attack where my friend next to me was killed. And I myself felt this trauma as I had to think about this man, this friend of mine, right next to me, who was killed during this uh, attempt uh, that was perhaps directed at me. Mais aussi mes filles étaient prises en otage. And also there were girls that were taken hostage in some of these situations that I have witnessed. J'avais quitté le pays. I left the country. Pour me mettre à l'abri de, de, de ces traumas qui étaient très très importants. To escape from this extremely traumatic situation. Alors que j'étais à l'extérieur, les femmes ont fait quelque chose de formidable pour moi. And then when I was outside of the country, women did something absolutely extraordinary for me. Elles ont écrit au président de la République pour demander à ce qu'il me ramène au pays et qu'il assure ma sécurité s'il considère qu'il est un président de, de la République et donc doit protéger sa population. These women wrote to the president of my country and they said, please give me protection, please give him protection. If you're really a president, you need to create a situation where he is protected so that he can return. Pas, elles n'ont pas eu de réponse. They did not get a response. Elles ont écrit au secrétaire général des Nations Unies. They wrote to the secretary general of the United Nations. Elles n'ont pas eu de réponse. There was not a response. Elles ont décidé de non seulement commencer à vendre les légumes et les fruits pour payer mon billet de Boston à Bukavu, mais également, elles ont assuré que chaque jour, il y aura 25 femmes qui vont entourer ma maison et que si je suis attaqué, il faut d'abord tuer ces 25 femmes. J'avais trouvé ça, j'étais incapable de continuer. So, not only did they organize women from Boston to Bukavu, but they decided that they themselves would unite and set up groups of 20 women who would guard my house around the clock and that they would protect me if anyone wanted to try to attack. Je crois que ça c'est une force que, qui vous inspire et qui vous pousse à ne pas abandonner. Merci. And that's a strength that is inspirational and how can you abandon anything in front of that? So apparently the embassy is calling you, and I'm sure you're in very good hands. Uh, so let's thank Dr. Dennis, and uh, hopefully he will return before we end. <laughs> Now, I have several questions that uh, have come from students in the audience. And uh, these are questions that uh, have to do with whether or not our panelists have any advice to people who are considering a career in humanitarian service. And so all three of you have spent your life um, in these humanitarian causes, I'm sure along the way you've thought, maybe if I were to do it again, you know, I might do things differently. And, or maybe some positive advice that you would have. And uh, so uh, I'm combining several different questions here from students in the audience. Um, Tom, would you like to begin? the question is advice on uh, someone who wants to enter, uh, enter the humanitarian field. I think first off, uh, part of the problem is you, <clears throat> people feel a sense of hopelessness 
you see the problems as being too big. If you look at the big global picture, you say, well, what can I do uh, as an individual? Uh, there are too many problems in the world. There's too much poverty, there's too much war, there's too much this, too much that. So my first uh, advice would be, don't, don't think of that. Think of what you can do as an individual. And each one of you can do something. Uh, and in the end, what humanitarian work is, is you as an individual helping another human being on an individual level, on a person-to-person -person level. Don't think of it as coming to save uh, Sudan, or coming to save Chad or Congo. You, as, a, as an Armenian, can help a person in the Numa Mountains, one-to-one. -one. That's humanitarian work. So think of it on a very personal level. Uh, of course, that's the work that we all do, and uh, I think if you, if you choose this line of work, you will, you, will, you will never regret it. Whatever you do will be the most satisfying thing you ever did. It's, the satisfaction you get is worth much more than money. It's worth much more than a car, a new pair of clothes. I think you'll, those of you who've seen me, I'm wearing the same clothes for the past three days. <laughs> You'll, you'll never regret it, okay? You won't be rich, I promise you. You won't make anything, okay? But what, what, you, what you lack with your, your personal uh, lack of wealth, you'll get much more in return uh, for the, the, the privilege and the joy of helping somebody else. Take it at a, at a simple level, and you'll never regret it. Thank you. Um, humanitarian work is... It's more morally. And if you're ready to help, and morally you feel that, it, that's your feel. But if you feel like, okay, I'm gonna gain money or I get paid, it's, it's too much to risk. It's too much risk, and also it's, a, it's a emotional. You feel always, the people you are with it, you always feel the emotion. You're sad, you're crying, you, it, you see all these horrible things. But if you're ready to be immorally wanted to change or to be helped to other people, then it's the right way to do it. And it's, that way he said it is good because you're never going to regret it. You feel that end of the day, what did I do today? Did I, do, did I help anyone? Did I see any impact to what I did that day? Then that night you feel, you feel okay, you're gonna say, actually I did something today, and then you're gonna sleep better. So it's the way I work in Somalia now, it's even when I'm sitting here, I'm honestly worried a lot. I'm worried because the war, I'm worried because my girls are there, and when I'm here, I'm staying in a nice hotel. Most of times I might not sleep, talking to phone whole night, asking everyone what they're doing, are they okay, are they okay, are they okay? So sometimes people ask me, why don't you stay a little bit longer? But I feel when I'm in Mogadishu, actually I'm helping, seeing people, even though I know I can't do much, but at the same time I'm there. That makes me calm. I can see everyone are okay, but I'm not there. I feel, I feel everything is gonna be like, a lot of explosion going, and you never know what is the next time you, you leave the house, safely come back. So it's a lot of emotional and a lot of risk, but we chose to do that. But if you're willing to do part of that, I'm advising you, you all, we need all this world, they need us. They need us, and things are really, it's not about only money, it's more, helping other people, even advocated for them. Now I'm here, you are in safe place. You can advocate the issue we have in Somalia, which when we're there, we can't do it. It's too risky for us to talk about it. But someone who's in Armenia, he can talk about it. And that is help. So it's, it's a lot of, we all need your support. And when you wanted to work with them, um, humanitarian, I think is the way good work to do it. Jamila, do you have some advice? Yeah. 
well, uh, first of all, the advice I, I have on myself, which, um, through which I'm continuing my work, with all the problem we have in Afghanistan, with all the risk and challenges. Uh, there is a verse in only Quran says that the best among us you are those who serve others. And there is another verse that says that uh, uh, if you secure the life of one person, it means you have secured the life of all universe, not other human beings, all universe. It means animals, plants, everything you have saved. If you save the life of one person. So, uh, uh, usually in my work, uh, because I was not a professional, my own pre personal experience lead me to work, and uh, by each mistake, I learned how to take another step, how to promote, and with bringing one component, uh, uh, listening to people, to the need of people, we understand that there are some other steps are needed to be included. Uh, uh, advice for other people, for other uh, fellow peacemakers and leaders, uh, I believe that we are not God to change in everything as we want. We are human beings. This is our responsibility to change whatever is in our access and whatever we can do. So I hope by these small drops, one day it will become a river or an ocean which affect all, all uh, our world. And another advice that I have, have, I have learned in my work experience, together everything is possible. When we are together, then we can change very much of things. Um, like um, with small groups in our community, then in our society, then on regional level, on international level, we, we can be uh, positive agents of change, positive change. Thank you. I have a final question, but I want to make a preface to that question. One of the very unique things about the Aurora Prize is that while each, well, I should say the person who wins the prize receives $100,000, what is unique is that that prize winner then receives one million dollars to give away. That's a very different type of prize. And so I want to ask each of our remaining panelists to say what organizations they have identified to whom they would want and are planning to give if they win the prize the one million dollars. And why have they chosen those particular organizations? So, um, Jamila, let's uh, reverse our order and uh, begin with you. Uh, uh, well, there will be many organizations, but uh, I think those who have supported me to be in this position, uh, together with those organizations, we can spend this money uh, for better impact, for extended impact um, um, for our society and for our world as a whole. Do you want me to take name of those organizations and say something? Uh, yes, it? please, and just say okay. briefly the, what those organizations are and why you chose those organizations. Yeah, I think um, one will be Tanambam organization. Joyce Dubinsky is uh, uh, heading that organization. She might be here among us. Uh, she was in the hotel. She arrived with me. Uh, 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 Tanambam is a center of interfaith and, and, and a center of uh, religious peacemaker. Uh, uh, they recognized my work. They, they gave me award for the work I was doing. 
And also at the same time, they are giving me technical advice and technical support how to promote my work and, and my community. And another network uh, is by the name of WISE, um, that is also a network of uh, Muslim women scholars. That women from different corners of the world who are Muslim and who are scholars and who are the human rights defenders and women rights activists, they made me able with their advice how to work with challenging imams in Afghanistan. Uh, their advice was really helpful for me. And uh, inside Afghanistan, Karama is uh, one of the network. Karama means dignity. That networks work for dignity of human rights, for dignity of human being, and especially for dignity of women. So I have learned from them. Uh, I have been their students uh, as an individual with that all impact I have uh, so far in my life. And I hope by contributing to all of them, we can make positive and better changes. Thank you. I think you really <laughs> wonderfully make the point. None of us create ourselves. We always stand on the shoulders of other people. And, um, so let's go to our next panelist, Fartoon. Um, what are the organizations, if you win the prize, you would give the $1 million to? I nominated um, Bensi Foundation, which is Dr. Macre, and I met him. We, we do the same work as he does, but when we're looking for the, the work he was doing, we Google it and see. We're looking for because it's now a lot of, I mean, how to, when it comes to the, um, what do you call it? The, I forget the name, but it's a, when the woman, um, the open, that it's a, it, it, ha, it, it, ha, it needs a special doctor. So we were Googling and looking for people who knows, and I saw the what he was doing. So I really see the work is doing it, and I nominate him, but also we hoping someday we have uh, some doctors like that in Somalia to do the, uh, this type of work he does, because we have so many women happening to them the same thing, but we don't have the special doctor for that. So I nominate him. Also, I nominate um, Vinci. It's an organization, Bosnian organization, which is a, uh, that's the trauma healing and the counseling after, after the war, which is the one of the thing, it's uh, now we are in war, but after the war, still we need this trauma healing, and they're doing really great work, so I nominate them. And also we nominate ourselves, Elman, because if we get it, we can, we can help a lot of people to do this work. Thank you. Thank you. Tom. Mm -hmm. So I've nominated, I've nominated three organizations. The first one is my, uh, my sponsoring organization, the Catholic Medical Mission Board. And this is uh, uh, the group that has sent me as a lay missionary. And they have a medical volunteer program where they sponsor uh, lay missionary doctors to work in other countries. They also have other, many other programs dealing mostly with HIV care uh, all throughout Africa. Uh, they're a very good organization. They use their money very efficiently. They don't waste money, which is the group I was looking for. Uh, the second organization is the African Mission Healthcare Foundation. John Fielder is here with us today. And this organization uh, tries to, to find uh, the niche to help support mission hospitals. Uh, at least in East Africa, uh, mission hospitals provide almost 50% of the health care in those countries. They're really a vital uh, part of the health care system. These are Christian hospitals. Motiv motivated by Christian principles, and the African Mission Healthcare Foundation exists to support these, uh, these hospitals. They also do help support us. Uh, the third, or third organization uh, is called Action Kanchanaburi. It's a German organization, and Gert is here today to re represent them. This is a very small, uh, a very German, a very efficient organization, and they use every last penny uh, efficiently. They do a lot of work with HIV care and leprosy. 
uh, we in the Numa Mountains are, are one of the epicenters in the world for leprosy. We have a lot of leprosy patients. It's still an active disease where we are. And they do a lot of work with, with this type of care. They've helped us a lot with sending containers and sending uh, materials to us. They've done it in a very good and efficient manner. Uh, I think they, all these organizations use the money very effectively and efficiently to help promote health care in developing countries. So that's why I chose those three. Thank you. I have several brief announcements uh, before we thank our finalists for the final time. Uh, one is the actual awards ceremony you can view on television or you can view through the internet on the Aurora Prize um, website. So I invite you to do that Sunday evening. Also, there are many different elements um, to Aurora, but uh, two announcements. One is here at AUA on Monday at 11 o'clock, uh, Dr. Samata will be speaking about how to eradicate poverty through quality education. And then on Tuesday at Yerevan State University, Actually, a good friend of mine, Harach Chilangarian, will be speaking on current challenges facing Christianity in the Middle East. I don't have a time on that, but I believe you can simply go to the website of Aurora and that will be announced. So there are many people in the audience I would like to recognize, but I'm not going to do that. Um, what I would like to say is that this is very much an effort of a number of people. I believe a hundred volunteers have been involved in addition to the Aurora team itself. And so let's thank our finalists and also the Aurora Prize itself. So uh, give our finalists just an opportunity to exit the stage, um, and then the doors will open. Yes, Martin. This is Vartan Gregorian, uh, one of the principal architects, and I'm going to ask you to just sit down here and uh, take the microphone because I think many of you know his background, um, president of Brown University, um, and, <laughs> and uh, he is uh, a, a genius at creative ideas. So please have a seat, or here's your microphone. Just, just use this mic. All right. I was not going to speak, but uh, our boss, Ruben Bartadiat, asked me before when I came, he said, I started the program initially with it, you have to end it. So I'd like to pay tribute to Ruben. Let's give him a big hand first. Not okay. So, one of the lines that has bothered me for years is Brecht's Galileo, the play Galileo. And there is a sentence that cursed be the land that needs heroes. Because ordinary things should be not heroic, they should be decent, right thing people can do. Love each other, respect each other consider each other not as socioeconomic units to be exploited, manipulated, and others, but to value them as spiritual beings, moral beings. So every year in the university, freshman class and others, I always say the following, which all the students are here. That's why I would say, the world, I said, is not going somebody like you again in the entire history of creation. You're, a, you're a unique moment. There's no tool like you same makeup, 
the same chromosomes. And that brings great deal of obligation to you. Do you decide to be in the book of the world? A dot, a letter, a word, a sentence, a paragraph, a page, a chapter, volume, or blank. What a terrible thing will be to be blank. These heroes, I'm glad we have heroes, because in the absence of being moral, to be normal, we need role models to teach us how to be moral. How to do the decent things, the most elementary decent thing, to practice one's profession. Nobody mentioned the professional ethic. Each of our doctors and each of our helpers will get one thing, do no harm. And therefore, one of the things that I was shocked when I went to Auschwitz, to see doctors in Krakow had invited Polish and other leadership of the city of Krakow. All of them came and they were shot. And all the doctors signed it, heart attack. You've never seen some in one day, so many people having so many heart attacks. So I found an organization that is doing something about it. It's trying posthumously to remove the doctor's title from there because they were not physicians. They violated their primary obligation to human beings. And that's one of the reasons I want to salute all the heroes here because they remind us how to be decent, how not to consider everybody an end, I mean means, but consider everybody an end. Not the rich and the powerful, but the ordinary. To practice one's religion, whether it's Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, all faiths are there that preach life, preach dignity. So why should somebody who practices it to be a hero rather than a practitioner? But because we don't have that norm, during World War I, World War II, we saw genocide, we saw the Holocaust. That's why we need these women and men, exemplary ones, to be heroes. For a while at least, till we become moral beings, we become decent. We don't manipulate, we don't aestheticize politics, whereby you can create a perfect unit, perfect circle. And all the aberrations there, all the branches, you eliminate without saying those branches for this beautiful entity you're going to create. It's one million people, six million people, one small tribe, women and others. And that's one of the fundamental things of this uh, Aurora Prize. It discusses about humanity, not Armenians. It begins with Armenians but goes to universal norms. Because we are one family of men and women in the world. All the Bibles, Quran, all of them say we are created. God has created us as almost image of his. I hope that. We don't do justice to the image of God if that's what God is, create image. It's the behavior. So Aurora wants to universalize the cause of suffering in all the countries, all the tribes, all the races, all the sexes, by one fundamental thing. Please use your conscience, practice your ethics, practice your values. You are your brothers and sisters keepers. And that's why I'd like to thank you for being best examples. And I disagree with Brecht. We need heroes now because this is the time the entire humanity needs role models. So thank you very much. These are the words of the president of the Carnegie Foundation. Thank you very much.